Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Maria Rosario Jackson, Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts in the United States, and uh, your moderator for this session today. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, thank you to IFACA staff and board and our hosts here in Sweden for your leadership, vision, and hospitality. Uh, and it's an absolute honor to be in fellowship with all of you to moderate this panel as we move into a day of thinking about solutions and implications for how we act on what we've heard on the topic of artistic freedom. We have the privilege of hearing from four colleagues this morning. Dr. Lisa Ravna Finbog, an indigenous scholar, curator, and poet from Sami and based in Norway and Finland. Dr. Hilma Farid of Indonesia, where he is Director General of Culture in the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology. Mr. Ernesto Otone, who is the Assistant Director General for Culture at UNESCO. And Dr. Alexandra Zantaki from Greece, who is the UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. Each speaker will have five minutes to offer reflections on what they've heard over the course of the conference and how that inspires their thinking about paths forward in protecting and advancing artistic freedom. As moderator, I'll help move the conversation informed in part through my lens. I've been in my position as chair of the National Endowment for the Arts for over a year now. And the NEA, just for a little bit of background, was established by Congress in 1965 as an independent federal agency in the United States. It's the largest public funder of the arts and arts education in the US. And by advancing equitable opportunities for arts participation and practice, the NEA seeks to foster and sustain an environment in which the arts benefit everyone in the country. It's an interesting, challenging, and generative time to lead from this particular perch, a federal agency with a national charge with its unique strengths and limitations, very different from other perches I've occupied, different from philanthropy, academia, local government, the nonprofit sector, and unincorporated grassroots efforts. All of us here are leading during a time of global polycrisis, as I've heard colleagues say earlier this week and this morning. A pandemic, climate issues, political fragmentation, exacerbation of racial and other inequities and more, including threats to freedom of expression and artistic freedom. Over the course of the conference, the concept of artistic freedom has been discussed in different ways as an issue of the art world and a particular threat to artists and those who enable their work in the cultural sector, as a facet of the larger struggle of historically marginalized and oppressed groups as they fight erasure, oppression, and forced assimilation with artists often on the front lines. We've talk, talked about artistic freedom in relation to actively and externally imposed and sometimes officially sanctioned censorship. We've talked about it as in relation to the process of self-censorship as people deal with the gaze of a possible oppressor and as they weigh personal and community risk. I would add that the concept of artistic freedom is also relevant to another reality with which I'm deeply concerned, and that is the limited pathways that artists have to diverse ways of expressing and creating their careers. I believe to my core that the arts are at their most powerful when they don't exist in a bubble, in isolation. The arts are powerful when people have many on-ramps to both active engagement in creative process as well as the consumption of art. They're powerful when they're maximally accessible and integrated into people's everyday lived experience, when creative process is understood as valuable alongside creative product. The arts are powerful when artists have many kinds of relationships with publics, not only as the makers of art products, but also as leaders we look to to help us lead artful lives, help us see things from different perspectives, ask questions, 
tell our truths, reckon with harm, be curious about others, see our common humanity, and understand our meaningful differences. The arts are most powerful when concerns about artistic freedom also include more expansive ways of inviting and supporting the participation of artists in how we shape our world and how we work towards more just and equitable communities. This includes artists stepping into career paths that have not been well paved, occupying jobs and roles we may not have even imagined yet. As we launch this day of focusing on ways forward, let's remember, as so many colleagues have reminded us, that the past three years have been made possible or have made possible precedents for new ways of thinking and working precedents that help us understand that we don't just have to snap back to what was pre-pandemic. There's a window of opportunity that won't be open for long. We're at a time when we're summoned to lay the foundation of the next version of the sector, the next version of communities we want to see and inhabit. So how do we move forward with our concern for artistic freedom? Let's start with Dr. Finbog. Yeah, I'm tired of being good enough. Your work is exquisite, impressive, so cutting edge, just not for us. But this is no reflection on you. We love your work. We love you. You are good enough, just not for us. I'm tired of being good enough. Can I talk to you? Can I learn from you? Can I possess you? Extractivism is the fuel that keeps the world running. Speak up. Speak loud. Speak. The work that you do is appreciated. Diversity, which we embrace. Understanding, which we exude. Progress, which we initiate. The work that you do is necessary. You are good enough, just not for us. I'm tired of being good enough. Few of you know me here, and those that you are likely well aware of my penchant for critical reflection, as well as my tendency to be very vocal about said reflection. Qualities of my person that are not always popular with established institutions uh, of authority and money. That is not to say that I do not work with or even within said institutions. But it seems to me that the level of engagement rests upon short-term relations where I am brought in to think and to write, but rarely to execute. To produce and disperse knowledge, but never own it. In this sense, I am not unaware of my privilege. I do, after all, get paid for the work that I do. But the payment sometimes seems or feels like hush money, facilitating my abrupt and silent removal. I find myself, more often than not, a sojourner, good enough to temporarily reside, but not to settle. In saying this, I recognize that the situation I have sketched is not a reflection on me. It is a reflection on legislative powers and institutions appropriating words of diversity, inclusion, and indigeneity, but without actually committing to what that means. It is a reflection on the power dynamics seeded in and by the colonial structures born from Western imperialism, a process that continues, albeit in new forms and disguises. It is a reflection that I find at this summit. The last few days I have listened. I have listened to many wonderful conversations, explored various topics, and been privileged by the sharing of impressive thinkers and visionaries. 
and yet I feel tired. There have been a lot of fancy words about how we need to embrace diversity, how we need to include the margins, giving space and room to the marginalized. The problem is, in saying so, you are still centering yourself. And by centering yourself, you are still, whether consciously or not, retaining power and authority, inviting the outliers to enter your space, but only for some time, visitors and guests, but never the hosts. I do not mean to undermine or diminish the work that you all do, but I want you to consider this. Good intentions mean very little if the impact does not align with said intents. To include is not enough. Ownership is necessary. The ability to lead is needed. And your willingness to step aside is encouraged. I am tired of being told that I am good enough only for the next sentence to state, just not for us. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, okay, great, sorry. Um, what a great opening. <laughs> so thank you, first of all, to uh, invite me to speak at this summit. Um, it has been highly interesting uh, the last uh, two days. I learned a lot from the speakers. And for me, uh, for my uh, line of work as a director general, it's mostly administrative. So this is really a relief to have some critical reflection of what you are actually doing. Um, I only could join on the second day, but uh, I watched the video of the first session, um, and I get the impression on the first session that we were given a canvas, yeah, um, where the a canvas to be painted with ideas, thoughts through conversations, and I used uh, this uh, painting analogy because y yesterday we had at dinner we were presented with a striking visual image, like a very detailed mosaic, um, and you can imagine um, the hard work that went into it. Um, and at this uh, summit, I also learned that um, people are not only presenting what they think is important, uh, there were um, sufferings, um, experiences, hard work um, behind all these ideas. So I really appreciate that. And um, we can see, um, this is the first point that I'd like to make here, the massive changes in the landscape of artistic freedom. Um, using the analogy of the canvas, it's expanding. Um, all the time we try to grasp what it, um, to, to hold it and to paint it, it's growing. Yeah, it, uh, and this is what I think uh, is happening in the last 20 years, the massive changes in the landscape of artistic freedom. We discussed geopolitical changes in the two, last 20 years, uh, the climate change, uh, deepening socioeconomic crisis, um, widespread conflicts, health crisis, in short, what one speaker uh, yesterday uh, called the poly crisis uh, in one of the panels. And I think we can be actually more specific. It's the crisis of the global liberal order. Yeah. And before you might before, like in the 1990s, you might have heard excuses from authoritarian leaders and governments uh, about this, um, about them having a kind of distinct democracy uh, where we have a different understanding of human rights, etc., etc. The kind of cultural exceptionalism to justify repression or violation of human rights. Today, there's no need to do that anymore. Right. This is the change that are uh, currently taking place. Yeah, there's even no need um, to make these excuses. There are even challenges, no ideas challenging the idea of democracy itself. 
And um, now you begin to see that even in countries with strong democratic tradition, um, where people think that freedom and rights can be suspended on the grounds of emergency. And the first major emergency in our recent history is 9-11. And the second one, the, major, the second major one, would be COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, this is where a time where um, rights, um, freedom, can be suspended on the ground of um, emergency. And now, today, more and more countries uh, begin to make exceptions because of their own emergencies. We have little emergencies everywhere, be it war, well, conflict, or health crisis, and whatnot. And um, on one hand, this is an alarm, alarming erosion of freedom. Um, we see authoritarian practices popping up everywhere. But on the other hand, there's a very serious question that I think that we need to think about. A freedom to do what? You know, what is the freedom actually for? So when facing authoritarian regimes um, who impose state of emergency for the sole purpose of maintaining power, um, we know that the term emergency is actually used to excuse, um, to suppress differences. But when we are faced with climate emergency, health emergencies, what should we do? Is there freedom for climate denial or anti-vaccination? Um, which might be here among us. Um, and is there a freedom? Yeah, more than once I actually have met people who are arguing that. People who I know to be human rights advocate, freedom fighters, but come up with the idea during the health crisis that COVID-19 is basically a Western conspiracy. Yeah, um, Working hand in hand with the uh, pharmaceutical uh, industry. So we have that kind of opinion out there. So what should we do? Do we should we take like Voltaire's position? I defend your right to uh, even I, if I don't agree with you, uh, I defend your right to say so. Um, and do we allow this climate denialism? While in the Pacific region, um, we have uh, they are already experiencing uh, the impact of the climate crisis. I think we have Antoni Turua here from the Cook Island. Uh, for those who think that uh, climate crisis is not real, um, I would suggest you have a session with him uh, to get a better idea of what is actually going on. Um, so back to the question of fee for what? In the provocation and, and response session yesterday, we talked about that. And I think Mark Yosef here um, made a very interesting presentation about designing the future and that artists should be part of it. Um, there isn't a assumption that artists represent values and good practices. But at the same time, in the workshop of the first day, there was also a vision um, of a dystopian future. Um, and I think we have that, like, both sides, yeah. Um, there's a very um, apocalyptic view on the future, but on the other hand, you have a very optimistic view. And I think we should continue uh, this discussion. Um, on the one, one hand, we should maintain the critical spirit by imagining best scenarios, but on the other hand, not losing enthusiasm and getting trapped in that uh, apocalyptic vision that will actually make authoritarian po power even greater. And the experiences of rising nationalism that we discussed yesterday um, can, can actually uh, speak to how authoritarian power can thrive on hopelessness and despair apathy and inaction, and that, that's the last thing that we want uh, in this summit. The second point uh, that I think is also important is to understand that freedom is the product and result of struggle. Yeah. So freedom does not come because of the goodwill of the powerful, but because there is pressure to grant that freedom. And this is quite clear if you look at the history of the integration of norms and rights uh, of freedom. Um, but I think what is important here to understand that this is not a linear form of struggle with a clear end or um, um, ideal um, end. And yesterday's session, in the session on nationalism, there was an impression of seeing the clouds in Sweden as well. 
Yeah, so things might change. Um, um, countries that have like long democratic tradition might fall into um, or at, um, allow authoritarian practices to happen and the other way around. One minute more, okay. So and the last thing is about um, what to support and uh, where does the uh, freedom of uh, artistic freedom actually resides with? Is it with the artist or is it an artistic practice itself? Um, last year, or three years ago actually, Indonesia finally had our own endowment fund that can be used to by artists and cultural workers. And there was a special mandate in the framework of utilizing the endowment fund to build an inclusive space. And there is a presidential regulation actually on culture that explicitly mentioned this. And with this mandate, um, we support, for example, a film festival um, bringing in the critical voices from the Middle East to our uh, madrasas, the Islamic boarding schools, and the idea is really to bridge differences. So this is, um, I think, what is also important to understand that um, freedom um, of expression and artistic freedom should be used um, for the purpose of building peace and justice. So there are many more things that I want to say, but I'll stop here. Thank you. So good morning to all. Um, first, let me thank uh, IFACA. Finally, UNESCO came to IFACA. So we are here after many years of trying to. Uh, I wanted to start, uh, but you will need your phone. It's a poem in Spanish. And it's a poem from one of the talented and uh, beautiful writer of Nicaragua, who for the second time in her life, she is uh, living in exile. Her name is Gioconda Belli. It's very short. It's called Uno no escoge. Uno no escoge el país donde one nace. One doesn't choose a country in which one is born, but one loves the country where one was born we do not choose when we are going to be born, but we should leave a footprint from our time. Nobody can run away from their responsibilities. Nobody can cover your eyes, your ears, or be silent and cut your hands. Everybody has the duty of love that we need to fulfill a history that needs to be born and a goal that needs to be reached. We haven't chosen when we would come to the world, but now we can make the world that will be born where the seeds will be born and grow, the seed that we brought with us. In talking about freedom or what it means freedom associated with cultural rights. And uh, you will allow me to get a, a little bit out of my spectrum as uh, Assistant Director General of UNESCO in culture and tell you a, a little story. I'm a child from the exile, yes? I lived 17 years in more than 12 countries in exile from my country, that is Chile, the same country from comes Magdalena. All the words that I've been hearing are the same words that somehow um, were in my head during yes, one third of my life in exile. You're speaking about what it means to hear hate speeches, what is to feel migrant or immigrant, what is fear to be minority, what it uh, to be excluded, what uh, it seems like non-understood. But at the same time you hear solidarity, you hear empathy, you hear um, uh, feel of belonging. And that is what culture is defined about how we build society with what we are, what we bring, 
from each and every context in which we are living. And I believe that when you are talking about artistic freedom, uh, as it is understood by the definition at UNESCO, it's not only about every stage of the cultural value chain. And we have been speaking about creation, production, uh, distribution. It's also how we include the right of all citizens to access to the full diversity of cultural expression. So it's not only about those who are creating value. It's also those who are participating of this value. And he, those who want to participate in a more freely way. So, yes, that includes the right to create without censorship or intimidation. It means to have uh, artistic work supported, fair remunerated, and uh, intellectual property, as it means, protected and ensure freedom of movement. But today, what we see is uh, it gives us some food for thought. How to, do we give the right and deserve space to those at the core of our creativity? Civil society, artists, cultural professionals, leaders, including within our UN system and agency, uh, multilateral agencies. Last year, and Paolo Rafael is here, we organized the first meeting uh, of cultural ministers, Mondia Cult, after 40 years uh, from the first Mondia Cult and 28 years after Stockholm. And uh, at this meeting, we had more than 150 ministers that came together of culture, where they put cultural rights on the top of the agenda. But they did it not only using what we know, the 2005 Convention on Diversity of Cultural Expression, not using, not using the status of artists of 1980, but to putting it in a holistic point of view. Cultural rights should be at the center of sustainable development. We should build together whatever agenda will come uh, beyond 2030, culture as a uh, long-term goal. Why? Because culture sectors needs to be identified? No. It is because cultural rights are part of human rights. And that's what today we are fighting for. How we ensure that we can balance frameworks between global north and global south. How we have the needed data that today we don't have about the cultural sphere, and not talking about sectors. And for this, Mondia Kurt in his declaration uh, decided to create the first global report on culture. How we involve civil society, institutions like many of these, Free Muse, uh, Action for Hope, Artists for Hope, or Artists at Risk, and there are many others. How we build and fill the gap that today we cannot work alone. Finally, and uh, I know that we're going to discuss many of these items right now, but we need to fight for the right to heritage, and I'm meaning heritage in the bigger sense of the word, and, and, and identity. We will hear many of you talking about indigenous rights. Well, today we have the opportunity. We have a decade of indigenous languages that we are opening to speak about what is happening right now in many countries, like in Sweden. So we'll continue this dialogue. Thank you so much. Good morning. When I heard Lisa 
talking, I felt guilt. I felt I'm not doing enough. I'm not achieving enough. I am not enough. I am one of the 54 independent experts that have been appointed at the United Nations to monitor and help the implementation of, in my case, cultural rights. I am an independent expert. I am unpaid and this is my second job. The first job as a professor of law at Brunel University London pays my mortgage. And I find it very interesting how being Greek, coming to the UK, um, being in the UK when the um, Greek big financial crisis was taking place, how I found myself from the periphery to the centre and then from the centre back to the periphery. Somebody yesterday talked about the binary uh, way of looking at things. And sometimes we have to acknowledge that some nations, some peoples, are not being enabled and we have to work. And we also have to be aware of our positionality and where we are, whether we're at the centre or whether we're at the periphery. My work is about um, monitoring cultural rights and I focus on uh, several aspects, but really based on international law. So international human rights law standards require states to um, recognize the right of everyone, not just citizens, everyone, um, to um, be, um, to engage in artistic um, endeavors, whether professional or not, but also to be the audience and the recipient of art as well. So it's about access, but also about participation. So, um, so international, my mandate could be a point of uh, unifying, um, as I said before, unifying all these different um, uh, expressions of art and these different artists in a way that um, they could lead the quest at the United Nations for better protection of artistic freedom. I perceive my role not as leading, as, but as being here to enable the leaders, the artists and the civil society and the audiences to push for um, their rightful um, uh, protection. Um, and of course the United Nations has a lot of weaknesses and we have to remember that the United Nations um, is a cluster of states uh, that thank God they give quite some space to civil society, but still the decisions are being made by states. So that's why we have to engage with states, but also engage with civil society to recognize um, what we have to do next. And yes, there is a lot of work to be done, but at the same time, in these three days, I recognized quite a lot of things that have been done. So I recognize that states, art councils and the civil society now think in terms of indivisibility of human rights, that you cannot have artistic freedom if you don't have economic security, if you don't have social security. I recognize that um, there is space for civil society more than ever at the United Nations, but also in other fora. I recognize that the United Nations and UNESCO have started speaking a language that is more similar. We both talked about cultural rights. We both see um, a human rights framework that applies to artistic freedom. So even though UNESCO has been set out to focus on the protection of culture per se, and United Nations and my mandate focuses on the rights to culture, to participate, access and participate in culture, Yet, we have um, seen that in the last few years, we become closer and human rights standards, cultural rights standards, um, get more into UNESCO standards. I also recognized that maybe I was a little bit unfair to cancel arts, uh, art councils, and they are seeing now their work not only as founders, but uh, funders, but also as 
um, working in development, cultural development, which is something which we need so much because the emphasis is still so much on economic development. And I also recognize that um, this focus on the illegal war at the moment that is going on in Ukraine has allowed us all to see that there are funds and there is space and there, is, um, um, uh, there are tools um, to help protect the cultural identity, uh, the arts and the artistic freedom if there is a political will. And I hope there will be more political will around the world. But in doing all this, in having and using this tool of the mandate that I have at the United Nations, I need help. I need the civil society to tell me how to protect their cultural, um, their artistic freedoms, but also where there are problems. The United Nations does not have the mandate to go to specific states and tell us where the violations are. You have to help us with that. Um, art must get everywhere, not just in cultural rights and not just in the cultural sector. It must, it is um, focused on, it must be focused on how the vision we have about health uh, in politics, the vision we have about the future. Um, so I think that this conference has been very important in highlighting the gaps and hopefully also highlighting ways forward. And I hope that my mandate also is one of the many ways forward. Thank you. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you to all of our, our colleagues who spoke. And several things uh, came up, and I'll just uh, summarize a, a few key thoughts. We talked about shifting power. We talked about the extension of the concept of artistic freedom to human rights and all people, the particular role of artists in change, and the role of states and civil society at their best in advancing human rights and more justice. So in some ways, uh, we've taken what is already a complex issue and, and lifted up even more complexities. And I think that there are some uh, particular perspectives that are made possible from the various different seats that each of you hold. So I am curious to just kick off the conversation by asking from your particular seat, what is the most important thing to do? What, is, what, do, what do you see as a path forward uh, related to this complex issue of human rights, um, artistic freedom as a dimension of that, shifting power, advancing the role of artists, and relying in some part on states and civil society from your perch, what to do? And I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you for a very interesting question and also a very valid and important one. So uh, to speak very briefly about my background, I am trained as an archaeologist. Uh, I hold a doctorate in museology, which is the science of museums. Before that, I was, as Osa Sima so beautifully put it the other day, um, raised into my culture and language by living it. I was raised in a Sami home uh, with some, uh, and with that came also the ways of my people. So our ways of being, which we can term ontology, our ways of knowing, which is epistemology, and our ways of doing, which is axiology. One of the ways that I got this training was through the practice of Twitchi. So some of you, and I will, uh, especially those in Norway and Sweden and Scandinavian countries, Finland, will probably recognize the term Twitchi as Sami craft, the handcraft of the Sami indigenous people. That's not correct. Craft is a colonial translation. There is no translation for the term, but what Twitchi encompasses is a Sami epistemology. 
So the ways you grow up learning your world, learning to know it, learning to uh, articulate that world comes with the practice of doji. In that sense, the practitioners of doji, which is the doyas, um, and I myself am recognized as, as such, are the academics of the Sami epistemology. But when I spoke my words of knowledge for my people, no one would listen. When I tried to explain and articulate the philosophies, the very ways of understanding the world outside of my communities, no one would recognize that what I said was valid. Today, and now we're talking 20 years later, um, I have achieved a ranking within the Western educational system. I am a doctor of museology, which means that suddenly what I say about my people's knowledges, about my people's practices, are recognized. They have suddenly become valid, not because my words have changed, but because now I have the backing of the Western educational system. This is the problem. When we talk about the West, we talk about a normative center. Those that are outside of that center, the groups that are on the margins, that are marginalized, they have their own valid systems of knowledge, epistemologies, valid ways of experience and viewing the world, ontologies, and valid ways of operating that world, which is axiologies. But these ways are not recognized within the center. So we have to do twice the work. We have to be educated in our own culture's ways of knowing and doing, and then we have to go into the Western educational systems and get another education. I have been educated for 40 years, my entire life. Half of those, half of that time is not recognized as valid. That is the problem. And that is what institutions need to focus on, that their structures and systems are operating on a very specific way of thinking about the world, a Western way of thinking about the world, that oftentimes disregards and even ridicules other ways of understanding the world. This needs to change, and this is your responsibility. All of you coming here are saying that you want to take that responsibility, you want to change, and you can do so, but not alone. You need to invite those from the margins, those from the other ways of knowing and doing. Not only invite them in, but give them positions of leadership. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I really appreciate that um, people are bringing uh, their personal selves into the conversation as well. So there's, uh, there's not just the professional armor that is uh, holding up the, the presentations, but there's uh, sharing of personal experience, and I'm thinking of you, Ernesto, and your remarks and the the poem you read, and then your reflection on being in 12 different countries in 17 years as uh, someone in exile. How does that and the conversation that we've been having inform your understanding of what's possible from your perch at UNESCO? Well, I, I'm always say that. Normally, I should be the, the most boring of all of you because I work in an organization that knows about bureaucracy. <laughs> but I'm in the best field that you can imagine. I've been in the field of culture since I was six years old, working uh, in television. So um, today what I see is that well, I'm, in, I'm at UNESCO for five years now, in charge of the culture sector. and. Uh, when I arrived, I was the Minister of Culture in Chile. When I arrived, um, my father worked at UNESCO 30 years ago, so I know about UNESCO. But I didn't understand what was 
the, the meaning of culture at UNESCO. I knew about the conventions, because we have to deal with it. We knew about recommendations. We knew about the mandate of UNESCO in all these fields of action. But the first thing that uh, I made is how I integrate my life in an organization that somehow represents the antipode of what I am. Mm. I will say this. And in five years, I have been learning that it's not true. But there is, and, and I come to what was said two minutes ago, that the vision that was instructed to all people that work at UN level, at UNESCO, is one-sided si one vision, Eurocentric vision, sorry to tell you, but that's the truth. And if you don't understand culture from a holistic point of view, that is where we come from here in uh, the indigenous cultures or First Nation cultures in, in other countries, or from South America. We don't separate intangible with tangible. It's impossible. They are integrated. We don't can understand intangible without the development of creative, creative industries. You cannot separate commercialization with fair remuneration. And at the end, and that's why I'm so happy to see that and, 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 and that my dear friend recognized that we have been dealing to come back to the essential of what culture means for a child of fifth year, fifth, uh, fifth, six, seven years. And it's how we integrate all those elements that are around us. And then when you come to a table, you are invited to somebody, you don't come to tell your story. You come to exchange with this person, to receive something so that you're integrated in your life. And that's the way that we uh, now understand that organizations like us are dealing with. It's not about finding money, money from, and, and from uh, very good donors like SIDA here in Sweden. It's how they work with those projects in those countries where they can, sh they can share experience, knowledge, and integrate it also in their vision at national level and how they deal with many problems that you have at, the, at, at national level or local level. And that's the vision that should be shared when we think on international uh, organizations. That multilateralism is not only about politics, it's principally about policy. It's how you help for development in a more solidarity way of understanding the world. And I believe that all the discussion during these two last days have been if we are not working all together, wherever you are, to make the changes that we need after COVID, with the situation of war in Ukraine, but also in Sudan, uh, in Mali, we will not achieve anything on changing the, 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 the conception that we have, that culture has to play a role that is at the core of all developments. Thank you for that. I, I'm hearing your reintegration of culture, um, which requires paradigm shift, and pushing up against structures that aren't built for that reintegration or the paradigm shift. And I'm curious, Hilmar, um, in your role as Director General of Culture, what do you see as possible if, if you agree that there's a, d a need to move towards that integration? Uh, well, before that, let me go back um, to what um, Lisa Please. said about um, bringing in different elements of society, including like, marginalized people, into the discussion, which I think is very essential, not only to understand the conditions of freedom or unfreedom that it keeps changing, 
uh, nowadays, uh, but also to look into the possibilities uh, for the future. And um, I couldn't finish my what I uh, what, but I will say it now. Um, the question of fear, I mean, is central uh, in the discussion here. Yeah, fear has many, many dimensions. Like people have different kinds of fear, but the kind of fear that I'm uh, that like to address here, um, this is based on my experience uh, working um, to defend uh, artistic freedom uh, in Indonesia. Sometimes, I mean, you have to confront people in power, yeah, um, to do that kind of work. For example, the police. Yeah, um, police will come in, disrupt. Uh, a performance or stop uh, screening of a film simply on the idea because they don't understand it, right? And why do you do that? Right? Yeah, because we don't understand. And we don't like what we don't understand, right? So there's a certain kind of fear in there um, which I think uh, also needs to be brought um, to the table yeah? so we can actually understand what is the play here. I mean, um, we've been spending so much time on exposing uh, what is wrong and how to correct that. But little have we done about engaging actually people um, to address these issues. Yeah. And I think this is a very important um, um, uh, element here. But apart from that, apart from the fear of the people in power, um, the kind of fear and anxiety that we have in the in the general population that is not like rising and they don't see a way out. Yeah, and indigenous communities in Indonesia, they are facing very difficult, dire situations with uh, expansion of plantations, mining, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know? And they don't see a way out. They've never been asked to discuss these issues. Their voices have never been heard. As you said, like perfectly uh, eloquently, um, uh, you're good, but not for us. And they're not part of the discussion um, at the policy level, let alone at the policy level, even at the more aesthetic or artistic level. So I think to broaden, to, to, to be more inclusive, yeah, is uh, really a key here. Um, if it's, is it possible? Yes, it is. Yeah, I and mean, you have uh, well-meaning people uh, in the bureaucracy. You have people who want change, but in order to understand what they actually aspire and why they couldn't do it for many, many years is really important. My, uh, I, I mean, I'm the first non-civil servant director general in the entire history of the Republic of Indonesia. <laughs> yeah, so normally it's a career that you build from scratch. Yeah, you ha you enter the bureaucracy. Um, from the lowest level, and then you go up, and the last four or five years, then you become director general. Um, that's the, 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 the um, ideal. Uh, I know, no, I, I was part of the human rights movement back in the 1990s. I was an activist, so to say, yeah, but then appointed to, uh, to the position of the director general. I'm the first one. There are only three or four people now. So it also signifies that things are changing in the way the state operates, the government operates, and this needs to be understood. Yeah. Otherwise, you would lose, uh, lose yeah, sight of all these like important small changes that are happening. Uh, while I think um, what is really important to, to, to pay the attention to the details, the inner workings, and the interplay of all these like different forces in a concrete sense. Otherwise, you would have like abstract discussions about freedom. Right, and it hasn't brought us very far. Yeah, probably intellectually, um, in cognitive ways. Yeah, it's 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 important yeah, to have better, stronger, solid ideas. But how to implement? Like how to make it work? How to bring or send your message message across the table? That's I think what is most urgent um, for us to do now. Thank you, thank you, Alexandra. In your remarks, you, you lifted up your experience as an immigrant. You referred to your role as a professor also. And then your second job, you said, as a special rapporteur. With those different experiences, um, what feels urgent to you? 
Um, this this experience is, um, you know, brought different um, uh, different elements. But I think that what is urgent uh, now is um, somebody said yesterday. I think it was Simon uh, solidarity and diversity, and this is something that we've been hearing a lot. But also effective <coughs> participation, because um, uh, so solidarity and uh, diversity, effective participation. So to ensure that um, the the voices of um, uh, artists and audiences and civil society are heard, um, and also to ensure that the focus is not is not only on one aspect. I think that um, sometimes I smile because I see that from time to time we focus on one issue um, as if other issues fade away. So we focus on very important um, uh, issues. We focus on Ukraine, but other wars are not taking as much attention anymore. We focus uh, in the past half an hour, we focused on indigenous peoples, but I haven't heard um, discussions about refugees and, uh, you know, their artistic freedom and, and their art and how, you know, they can implement their artistic freedom. Um, last month, I was I was delighted to um, I, I um, started a communication with the United States and uh, we managed to um, um, have a change of policy where Guantanamo Bay um, uh, prisoners, when they are released, now they can take their art with them and their art belongs to them. So this is a uh, this is quite a big achievement in in my mind. So there is a lot more to be done about artistic freedom and and prisoners, and also maybe focusing on what um, Ernesto was saying: the audiences, the civil society, and how they can participate. Uh, one does not only have to be a professional artist, although yes, we should um, uh, focus on that as well. So there are different little fires that I think that uh, there is an urgency of highlighting. And, and that's what I'm trying to do in, in my reports to the United Nations General Assembly, so basically to the states. Um, I have pushed for uh, development, not to be seen as economic, but also cultural. I have pushed last um, March uh, on migration and, and cultural rights. Amazingly, the UNHCR, and I think I can say that, um, could not see the connection between <laughs> cultural rights and, uh, and uh, uh, refugees. And, and they thought that, you know, there's an urgency for um, non refoulement and the right to asylum, which there is. So I think that, you know, just spreading um, the, our, our wings and our foci and ensuring that we um, put the light in uh, all the gaps and in the gaps that maybe we didn't see yesterday, but now we start seeing. Thank you for that. We're going to open the floor up in a moment, but I, I just want to lift up something that I hope gets picked up in our conversation as it continues. Um, I, I do believe that coming out of COVID, there is this opportunity to reset, and there's an opportunity to learn from the past three years. It's a window that isn't going to stay open forever. And the, the peril is just uh, the squandering of the opportunity to actually use that crisis to make progress. So I just want to put that out there as, as we continue the conversation. There's a, a different kind of urgency that has to do with this particular window of opportunity. But let's open it up uh, to P. Oh, there's lots of hands. Yeah. How yeah. are you going to do this? <laughs> Magdalena, you're going to help me with... with uh, Thank you. Um, I don't need to stand up. Um, I think there are so many people here are so moved that this has happened. We've been challenged, we've been moved, we've been informed, uh, we've been stimulated. Um, but a lot of us are also saying what's important is what happens as a result of this. And I'm just wondering, I know, know that there are, you know, universal periodic reviews, systems, there, there's, there are various ways of looking at things, but it would be wonderful to have some sort of a baseline survey of what's happening now so that it can be looked at in like three years, because it does take a long time to change policy and practice, so that something could be revisited periodically. You know, what is the impact of this conference? As grant applicants, we are constantly asked what's the impact of the 
funding that we've got. And, um, you know, we're, we're pressed to do that. So it'd be just kind of wonderful. I, my question, it really is a question, is there a way of monitoring the impact of this conference? Thank you. It's a great question to, to hold. Let's keep going. First of all, thank you so much for a fantastic panel, and these days have just been absolutely brilliant. Uh, I have uh, some thoughts about um, this conversation, and Mr. Farid, you... Yes, of course, can you hear me now? Uh, first of all, thank you. And uh, um, Mr. Farid, you mentioned, you know, should we accept the vaccine deniers, climate deniers? Uh, and I would like to, with, with respect, just challenge that a little bit. Uh, and I say thank you for, for mentioning it here because I feel that with artistic freedom and expression it's really easy when we don't really care about it. But when people don't agree with us or actually have opposite views and when it gets personal, that's when it gets harder. And we've talked about the rise of nationalism. We see the dark clouds and forces around the globe. And what I'm seeing is that if we don't allow people with different opinions and different perspectives, if we don't listen to them and include them in the conversation, they are being pushed to the fringes because they are the ones that are welcoming them. So the minute we start to gaslight them or, or label them as a vaccine denier, they might have hesitations because they have questions about it. Or people might believe the earth is flat. We know it isn't, but it's their right to think so. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we also have our blind spots and sometimes the good guys can become the bad guys uh, with the best of intentions. And uh, it is a known fact that freedom movements often turn into authoritarian movements after a while. And there are a lot of people around the world right now that are really concerned about that. So when they push back and they questioned what we feel should be natural, then yeah, I, do you see what I'm saying? So my question to you is basically this. Because this is a, a room full of leaders, you are leaders, how can we avoid uh, as gatekeepers to have, how can, we, how can we be inclusive of those people and those voices and avoid being authoritarian? Can I just please request that you ask the question briefly so we can get as many questions? Thank you. And I think somebody was oh, oh. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for this uh, great panel already. As a visual artist, I am a visual artist, but I'm also a semiotician. Uh, so so I, I have some insights, as so many of you have, in, in terms of behavior. We, we, we react to how we perceive the world. And this is an age-old thing. We, we think in binaries, but we know that it's only in the triadic thinking that we'll find solutions. So it's, it's a reflection that has been going on for a long time. And we see so much hope. I, I see so much hope in the world when people start talking about and being an anti-racist, changing labels. So I just had a question. What if we change everything and we say, instead of safeguarding artistic freedom, we say opposing artistic suppression? And, and change that. And it was something that was said in a panel earlier. If I go, it's my responsibility to enable others claiming their rights. What, what does it bring to the table if we say, it's my right to stand up against suppression that prohibits others of taking up their responsibility? Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you so much for a fantastic uh, panel and the thing I appreciated most about it is that people spoke uh, also in their personal capacities and we often miss that. <laughs> uh, I have a question to Alexandra. Uh, I truly appreciate uh, sharing with us some breakthroughs especially on UN level, on state level, because the last few days have been very dimming, you know, <laughs> have been mostly about the things we are not able to do. So it's always good to be reminded of the possibility for breakthroughs. 
But then you put the onus on civil society, and I've been I've been in the business, if I may call it so, of supporting independent cultural civil society for over two decades, uh, uh, and mainly in regions where civil society functions in, under extremely harsh conditions, so in the Middle East, in Africa. Um, and so, uh, building on Lisa's point, inviting civil society is not enough. Civil society comes to us as funders and says, ha give me, just cover my flight to go to a UN convention. They can't even afford the flights. They can't even afford the expensive hotels. Take the climate change example in Sharm el-Sheikh. Civil society struggle to make a place there in Sharm el-Sheikh, the human rights civil society, right? They didn't stay in the same hotels. They were even denied um, uh, uh, um, what sort of booking in hotels because of the Egyptian regime. So uh, the question is, please share with us the tools to make this invitation truthful and possible so we who work like uh, as uh, almost intermediaries uh, uh, can reconvince civil society that there is actually point in even trying to access UN uh, uh, forums and conventions because I do think it's worthwhile. So we want to make it work. Please hold the microphone close to your mouth, otherwise I can't hear you. And please stick to a question so that there's enough time for them to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Ola Raito. A lot of things has happened in the past 10 years in understanding artistic freedom. And I've heard many discussions here who go in all kinds of directions, including water pollution, poverty and whatnot. Every day, artists are being censored, persecuted, threatened. What do we know? What do we don't know? We know things because some people here have been documenting, monitoring violations. And all these people here doing this are very few with very few means. Unless we get statistics, unless we know, understand how many, where and how, we cannot have these conferences. And the ecosystem at the moment is threatened by lack of funding. Very few people, I have colleagues who have Stop having offices who have done this monitoring for years and years and years. So don't forget the ecosystem is important. Thank you. I'll be very, I'll be very brief. Thank you for the conversation. My name is Taiwa Falabi. Uh, I'm from Nigeria. I live in Canada. I'm a Canada research chair in social engaged theater. Uh, I'm with the University of Regina. I'm saying that because I want to start by celebrating the incremental change. So I was told that if I can this particular summit is diverse, which is great. So I want to say we're not, part of our role as artists is to keep pushing the border. In the light of the urgency, however, that's why we have, uh, we have to ask some of these questions. In the past few two, uh, two days, we've been talking about, we've identified that the real power belongs, lies with the artist. How are intermediaries, organizations, networks, and some of us were gatekeepers or becoming gatekeepers. How are we, in what ways do we need to get out of the way, hand over power, decenter ourselves, or even at times walk alongside these artists so that we can bring urgency to the need of ownership that we're talking about. So about decentering and really finding opportunities to be able to create new tools, alternative tools, but really in that process, finding our way to say, do we need to get out of the way? How do we do that? How do we work alongside? Um, whatever, in whatever spaces we're working as civil societies, as, as scholars, as artists, and all of that. Thank you so much. Okay, um, Osasima here. I want to ask a question, probably directed to my Sami sister. Lisa Rauna and Alexandra. And my question is, how do we, how do we keep the indigenous knowledge alive? Mm -hmm. how, how, because we all know we that work within the arts. You know, without becoming a good musician, you have to practice. Without being a good dancer, you have to practice. 
And the same thing with indigenous knowledge. You have to practice, you have to use it every day. I want to tell you an example that has moved my heart very deeply. And it was one and a half year before the COVID started. I was approached by a Sami elder who asked me, what are you doing after the new year? Are you sending your actors on tour? I said, yes, I am. And she said to me, please don't do that because something is going to happen in the world and it's going to affect your theater very much economically and it's going to affect the world. So please talk to your board, tell them that you are not going on tour, which I did. And I saved my theater from a, a small economic catastrophe. And what I, wanna, what I wanna talk about, because we have to get the right to practice <coughs> our traditional knowledge, because that can save a lot of problem in, in our way of working and our existence in this world. Thank you. Thank you for that question. There, there have been so many rich questions and wanna make space for the panelists to be able to respond to some of what, the, what was heard. Um, know that the next session is an open session. So there will be an opportunity to take these themes and extend extend the conversation. But let's open it up to the panelists. Uh, Guys. Go, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> uh, I've been making notes like uh, very... <laughs> um, uh, so way of monitoring the impact of the summit. Good way to monitor this imp the impact of this summit is what about next summit you have a delegation of purely indigenous people without considering borders or cultures, but invite a delegation, a big delegation of indigenous people to take part and be observers, but also include them in the planning of the summit. So which, for instance, <laughs> Why, ha why, why has not the Sami institutions in Sweden been included on the Swedish side of the development of the summit? That is one way that you can monitor what is happening. Hold the people in charge responsible. When you came here, how many of you knew about the Sami population? Very few. Why is that? Why has there not been a Sami presence, aside from me and my sister, Osa? Why are we the only one from a Sami community? We should be filling the halls. We should bring in our spirits and our ceremonies and our ways of being. But we have not been able to do that because we have not been included. That is how you measure the impact. And so, <clears throat> tools to change. Well, I don't remember who asked this question, but the tools needed to make change is to actually, what I was saying a little bit earlier about expanding how you understand the world. For instance, from my perspective, art is a colonial concept. And the reason I say that is because the canon of art values oil paintings, traditionally, uh, sculptures, architectural monuments, often produced by white and male artists. That is the can canon of art. In a Sami context, the term art only w was only established in the 60s. Before that, we didn't have a word for art. What we had was wogas, which is a term that can be if I need to translate it, I would say it means aesthetics, but it is more than that. It talks about how something is beautiful because it has function. Something is beautiful because it feels a purpose. That is how we value aesthetics. And where is the space in the international global art scene for our practitioners of Wagas? They're often disregarded as craft people, as well, not as artists. So I would say expand on how you understand art, expand on how you understand terms. And so the last, to pick up from what Osa was saying, seek consent. And I don't mean just ask one person, is this okay? I mean, ensure that you implement protocols. For instance, in your institution, if you are inviting elders, indigenous elders, Ensure that they get a travel companion, someone that can follow them. 
someone that, that can ensure that the elder is treated with the respect that they are owed. That is one way that you can um, implement uh, indigenous knowledges. Also, stop thinking that we are, stop thinking that when we speak of spirituality, that is some sort of like mystic, otherworldly. It's not. It's a very important part of our everyday life that informs the decisions we make and the ways that we interact with the world, the way that we see consent, the way that we honor and recognize that we are one small part of a much larger whole. Thank yeah, you. I think I'll stop there. Thank you for that. Uh, Alexandra Hilmer. So um, the uh, funding is an issue. Funding is an issue for me as well, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, I wish I had the funds to kind of get you all to Geneva and then to, for me to go to Geneva as well. Um, but, you know, this is not happening. So I have to be imaginative in the same way that you have to be imaginative. Um, the, the COVID have, uh, has helped us um, understand the importance of Zoom. Um, however, uh, uh, why? What is the point? I think that the point is that um, the, the point of engaging with the United Nations is the same as the point in doing advocacy. We all get frustrated by the times that we don't succeed. We all get frustrated by how slow the change is, but we continue to give part of our lives in doing advocacy because we believe that in, in the few times that change happens. The only thing that I can tell you is in the last 18 months, even in the last 18 months, I have seen change happening. I have seen change happening in the short term with communications. I was amazed that you can just send me an email and then we get into a confidential dialogue with the state. And then if they don't give us um, good responses, we name and shame and then things do happen. Um, in the short term, and I have seen things, changes happening more in the long term, you know, discussing, for example, culture as a standalone SDG in uh, the next post-2030 uh, agenda is something that gathers at the moment a lot of momentum, so changes do happen, but we need engagement, because otherwise if we don't have engagement from a variety of actors, the states, the loud voices that you talked about earlier are going to be the only voices at the international level. And that would be such a pity. And when we talk about gate, uh, gatekeepers and, and information, I think that this is where I believe in anarchy. So, you know, the most voices coming from anywhere without structures, without hierarchy, you know, we are willing, I am willing to listen to anyone that comes and tells me, and gives me some information and then try to verify it. And I think that Ola is absolutely um, right. We do need documentation. We do need to know what is happening. And I will try to get this information from activists, from art councils, from states, from UNESCO, from the World Bank, from anyone that is willing to give me this information. Thank you. Oh, and finally about indigenous, sorry, I don't want to forget about indigenous. I think it's very important to focus on the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a very far-reaching document that has gathered momentum and um, uh, legitimizes indigenous claims and to get the declaration everywhere in UNESCO documents, in UN documents, in, you know, uh, all the, the structures, uh, all the documents, but also get indigenous peoples in all the structures. But let's not forget other um, vulnerable or marginalized or uh, disabled, if you want, um, 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 uh, communities, such as refugees, migrants, uh, LGBT persons, etc. Thank you. We have only a couple of minutes, but I want to make sure Hilmer and, and Nesta have an opportunity to respond. Uh, yes, uh, uh, responding to your question. Uh, thank you very much. A question is really not about whether we should um, tolerate or engage people, but how? How you're going to do that? And I think here a Voltaire is not enough. Yeah, it's not, a, inclusion doesn't mean like simply tolerating what other people think, but really to engage them up to a point where you can reach to an agreement about something that you can hold on, um, uh, even if you disagree in the end, but then you have something that you can debate about. Um, the second one is about 
um, uh, funding and like how to um, democratize uh, funding to be more inclusionary. Um, it's a long story, but to make it short, um, uh, as I think what you raised is really important and uh, brings up some method methodology methodological issues. <laughs> Sorry. Um, about like how to do that, like how to be inclusive. I give you an example, a story from Indonesia. I mean, we uh, serve indigenous communities who want to rebuild um, their, um, say, tangible heritage, right? But they have to work uh, with a particular timing, which is not completely incompatible <laughs> with the um, administrative calendar they have you to use some certain kind of food that are only available on a certain time uh, throughout the year. And these are the things that we are constantly dealing with. It's my job to explain to the Ministry of Finance that this doesn't work. Yeah. So in order to be inclusive, then you have to step up and, and really to, to uh, defend that in order to, to make it more inclusive. So that's part of the job. I think, and um, I don't think that there is a blueprint uh, to do this. I mean, you have like constantly engage and then be open to changes um, as well. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> there was many questions, but there is one that is very important right now. It's about impact, follow up, and accountability, and. Um, I was thinking when I was hearing the, the questions that uh, I remember when I was art student 32 years ago um, and, uh, and uh, I needed to raise money for, uh, uh, I was director of, uh, of theater and, and uh, I wanted to raise money. And I remember the first meeting when I went to the Coca-Cola company. Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola <laughs> company. Because I had an uncle that worked there. <laughs> It's always the same. And uh, he asked me, but why Coca-Cola has to finance? It was uh, an Albert Camus, uh, Les Justes, about a revolutionary that uh, is a nihilist. <laughs> I said, because I'm in my existential phase, <laughs> why Coca-Cola has to be involved in your existential phase? <laughs> it's your problem. You are 19 years old. Why we have and say it because I want to move, and move in the older sense, society, post-dictatorial society. I received the money, not because they believed in the project, because he was the uncle, <laughs> the youngest <laughs> uncle of my mother. So it was very strange to make uh, a theater. It was in the Bellas Artes, the, the principal building of, of, of Santiago. Uh, it was... Les Justes, Camus, financed by Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, if my life will be like this, with a lot of contradictions, <laughs> well, okay, why not? But then when you go to the second, third, fourth uh, um, place, and you don't have any more Coca-Cola, and you don't have livelihoods, and you have a family, and you have children, and you work at restaurants in the night, you study. I worked in the opera. I sell mobi mobile phone. You say, okay, that will be my life? Is a discussion about uh, freedom, because I felt that I have the freedom of expression. I could do whatever I wanted. But I had no security net. 32 years after a young student come to me and he's confronted to the same problem. So there is a big issue and there's a big elephant in the room. We have not been able to tackle all the gaps that existed 30 or 40 or 60 years ago. Mm. So how we change it? And that's why I'm saying, first, the data recollection is fundamental. We cannot work 
if we don't have the right data to convince those, because we don't have to convince ourselves. We are all convinced that we are, that's important. It's the, 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 the decision makers that have to understand that we need. So we have to find the means to have the data, the right data, and to make it cyclic. We cannot do it every 20 years because it doesn't work. Second, we have to build this, what we spoke about solidarity, to come together, not any more silos. It doesn't work. It has never worked. Maybe for right now in the US, you have the, the strike of the, writers. of the writers. So yes, they will find a solution. And we know after six, seven months, as is in the 90s. But it will solve the problem for them, not for the other artists in, in, in this country or in other. So no more silos. We have to go to them. And third, accountability for everybody. And it means that all projects, as you are remembered, have to be impactful. And today, you, when you do a project of $22,000, you have to be impactful. You have also, and we are all accountable, to ensure that whatever money is spent by the member states that are part of our organization have to respond how we spend the money, how it has changed the life of some or all communities that are engaged. That's it. Thank you for that. Thank you all for uh, not only talking from your perch in your professional capacities, but for also giving us a glimpse into who you are as humans as you take on this, this uh, work together with all of us. So please join me in thanking the panel.